Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. So, a few announcements up front here on this week's episode. Of course, this is our last official episode of the Dick Tracy season, where we're going to be talking about the movie in great detail. But as far as what you can expect for the rest of the year, I initially had thought that I was going to start my next season rather quickly after this. Turns out I need time to record it. And because I have no AC here, I just hate recording in the room I'm in during the hottest days of the year in July and August. So I'm probably going to push it back a little bit and officially start the season in uh, September when I have a little bit more time. And I did not plan this at all. I know that's going to sound like I'm making it up. I truly did not plan to talk about assassins during a U.S. presidential election. And boy, after the last couple of weeks, does that show feel even more essential than it ever has before. So assassins is coming. It's not going to be here till September. We'll be doing our bonus episodes each month like we have been doing, so you can expect those in July and August. But September is when we're going to start our Assassin's season. Um, One little bit of correspondence I wanted to get to before we start this week's episode. This came in from Scott at the email. So you can send your own emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. He wrote uh, on the episode covering What Can You Lose, I think you were saying that the song reminded you of something from Assassins, but you couldn't figure out what. Don't know if I got that right, but in any case, the three-chord piano sequence that begins the song reminded me of It's In Your Hands Now from Roadshow. If you listen to the chords under the words It's In Your Hands Now, it's those three chords. It's literally the hook, if you can use that term, of the song. And um, I've listened to it. I can 100% hear what Scott is saying. So let's just listen to that now. Stay on track and you don't look back. It's in your hands now. Time to start your journey now. Never fall. I think it is what I was thinking of, even though I have really never done a deep dive into Roadshow. I know, shocker upon shockers. I have heard some of the songs, so maybe that was what was rattling around in my brain. All right, we've come to the main event. We might as well get into talking about the movie of Dick Tracy. So let me get on my nostalgia glasses and strap on in. Josh Shelton, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you, Kyle. I'm so happy to be on the podcast. I've been uh, listening and uh, very, very excited to actually be on the guest and talk about Sondheim and Dick Tracy. I mean, I think you have a good background to be able to talk about Dick Tracy in general, as far as like a movie goes, but maybe you can fill in the audience a little bit about uh, what makes you the expert. I'd I'd hesitate to call myself an expert. Mm -hmm. However, I certainly was the target demographic as a kid when dick tracy came out my brother and i i think we saw it in the theaters looking back i was obviously too young for (laughs) what it actually is but we proceeded to you know buy the toy radio watch we for halloween wore yellow fedoras and trench coats drew them all (laughs) like we were purely locked into who they were targeting that movie toward and as my life continued, I actually then became a filmmaker, but also have always been a musician as well and a songwriter. And so now I am writing musical films and I'm also a producer and I actually work for the Sundance Film Festival. That's amazing. Um, Okay. I guess for the music side of thing, what made you begin to write music? Was there a specific artist, band or anything like that? They're like, oh, I want to try my hand at this myself. Or was it not even that specific. It was just that you were always into music. Uh, Yeah. So I grew up in a musical household. My grandfather played trumpet. My father is a great songwriter. Uh, Neither of them did that by trade though. They worked in education, but Mm -hmm. they had this music side. So I grew up with music around the house. And then actually my middle name is Miles. And then (laughs) my grandfather, who's a trumpet player, gave me a trumpet. So I, my sort of introduction to taking music more seriously was 
playing trumpet. But like I said, my dad's a songwriter and I was raised in a house that was always playing jazz, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, or my mom was always listening to the soundtrack to West Side Story, Sound right. of Music. And then the other thing is, if you're a jazz musician, all the jazz standards are Broadway tunes. They're all right, Cole Porter right. Broadway tunes. So I kind of grew up with a different in to musicals and Broadway because it was kind of through jazz and records and then through all the the, the films. It was watching the Disney movies because, again, mm -hmm. I was exactly that age for the right. Renaissance. And then like I had West Side Story memorized when I was like 10 years old to the point where people thought I was like in a production or something. So <laughs> it was just always there. Yeah. No, I'm just a nerd. <laughs> um, as far as like your own musical films that you have made, are they in that jazz style or are they in a more musical theater style, would you say? I would say they are kind of neither in that they are, they're definitely not jazz, the ones I've written so far. First one I actually wrote when I was in high school, my brother and I made a musical together. And mm -hmm. I would say that was a little more uh, traditional musical theater. And then I actually got hired to write one a couple of years ago that was all hip hop R&B, which was actually really cool wow. and fun because hip hop rap is really great for dialogue. You can do a lot of cool things. And then this one that I just wrote, that I just filmed a short film is more, more traditional, more like somewhere between Sarah Bareilles or uh, Jason Robert Brown. It, where can people find these films if they want to check them out? The latest one, the short film will be on my website. We're sort of submiss we're submitting it to festivals right now. So we'll see if that comes out. Um, but Mm -hmm. On my website, it'll be there. We'll link to it or you follow me on Instagram. And I'm working with a production company in LA called The Barn that is producing original musical films. And then the the other ones, you can't watch the hip hop one, but you can listen to my demos are available online. That's cool. That's awesome. I mean, we already heard how probably one of your first times being introduced to Stephen Sondheim is from the score of West Side Story. When did you put two and two together that Sondheim was a composer you wanted to follow more in depth? My Sondheim experience was, I'll say, when I was in college, I have a vivid memory. I was studying music at a small liberal arts school where I saw, it was some sort of review or recital where people were performing different tunes. And they put on uh, a song from Sunday in the Park with George. And I was just floored. I was stopped in my tracks. Just what is this? I haven't heard music like this, but it also felt incredibly familiar. And I think it was, it's hot up here. You know, the start to act two, mm -hmm. I think is what it was. And I just, right when it was over, I went up to my friends who were performing or the professor. I said, who is this? What is this? And they're like, oh, it's on time. And I was like, okay. So I went and did the research I could on him. I ended up watching Sunday in the Park with George, writing a paper on it. And then what happened was I realized Sondheim had been a part of my life since I was a kid through West Side Story. Then <laughs> later through, then realizing he wrote the tunes to Dick Tracy, which I completely right. forgot until I moved to LA, you know, to become a filmmaker and was then re-watching films with that filmmaker perspective. And I remember pulling up Dick Tracy because I was like, I thought this movie looked beautiful. And I was watching it just from that perspective, which we'll get into later. And on the credits, songs by Stephen Sondheim popped up. And I was just like, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, what? <laughs> like, it, it's a really Sondheim fits in that unique place for me where his music, in addition to being brilliant and all those things, it's always felt incredibly familiar to me. Like someone, I think we come across these artists sometimes where it feels like they're speaking the same language that I'm speaking, albeit maybe they have a better grasp on the language than I do or are farther, much farther along. But his music just feels, while su constantly surprising, also very familiar. And I think it's that, mm -hmm. maybe going back to your earlier question, that combination of jazz roots with 20th century, you know, composition and thinking and the storytelling of musicals and songs, where it sort of brings these different pieces together that there's few or little other that I've ever found that I feel that connected and inspired by. 
Yeah, there, there is this special moment. I think I've spoken about this before about myself getting into Sondheim's work of like it just feeling like somehow he's taken all these jumbled thoughts that you've had in your entire life and then made a song out of it and be like, oh, well, this obviously is just for me. <laughs> somehow you <laughs> yeah. have only written this song for me in mind to, to the degree of just like this, this speaks so much to my experience that you're kind of like this lifelong fan then afterwards. For Dick Tracy in particular, you mentioned about going to the movie theater, but maybe a bit, a little bit too young. If you can recall being that child, watching it for the very first time, do you remember like what your immediate feelings were leaving the theater that first time? I remember it just being so cool. I remember him in the you know trench coat with the the wrist the the radio watch was the coolest thing ever. I remember mm -hmm. flat top being like the coolest bad guy henchman. There was just something so intriguing about him. I of course remember thinking Tommy guns were really cool. Again, in retrospect, it's like. Uh, I, especially as a parent now, <laughs> the, the use of violence in Tommy Guns is whole different. But at the time, it was like, this is cool. Obviously, being drawn to Madonna in ways that just like is, you know, don't quite know what you're feeling. Um, <laughs> and similarly, like loving the music and loving the kid, like re I, in rewatching it, some I'm connecting some dots here, but in rewatching it for this podcast, I was taken back to this nostalgia of like, oh, the kid, him jumping mm -hmm. on the back of those cars was like so exciting. And it felt, you know, I was able to definitely use the kid as a surrogate into this world. So, yeah, I just remember coming out so excited. And I, and I do want to call out like right right now, too, that that I don't have his name right in front of me, which I should. But the, that kid's performance I think it's a pretty solid performance for, for the 1990s when I have this theory that nowadays, like, it's almost weird if you don't have, like, at least a solid kid's performance. But, like, that's a very new thing. Growing yeah. up, it was like most kids' performances were not all that good. <laughs> yeah, there was, I mean, there was definitely a style of kid acting in the 80s and 90s that when it worked, it worked really well. And that kid, of course, I'm blanking on his name, but, you know, then he was in Hook um, as right. well. So he has like sort of two iconic, but then I guess also not particularly box office successful films. But if you were the age, right. he was in two great, in two movies. Oh, I mean, that was, okay. The, both of those movies that we've now just referenced, Dick Tracy and Hook, this is such a great example. Uh, and we'll get into this when we, when we move into like the response and reception to the movie. But when you're a kid, obviously you're not into like box office returns. Like you don't care. You just go and watch a movie and you, you know, go on with your life. But there's certain films that because you see them so often or like they're a staple of, you know, you and your friends watching them or they're on cable all the time. Um, at least I'm, I'm revealing my age here that I'm speaking about watching movies on cable. But internally, you're like, well, obviously that movie was a huge success and like everybody watched it. And then you look on Wikipedia and like, oh, nobody went and watched this and everybody hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then and also then you're seeing it at McDonald's and you're seeing all the marketing and you're you're seeing all the other things. So it is everywhere. And um, what you we now know later is you write, oh, that's that's money they're spending. <laughs> that isn't that the right, movie yeah, is so yeah. successful. It's at McDonald's and, and Disney's put it everywhere. So, yeah, absolutely. When you're growing up, especially at that time when Hollywood was, you know, making those kind of sorts of big pushes and less movies were made, it really felt like for me, the Dick Tracy was everywhere and it was fantastic. And yeah, I just remember being fully caught up in it. It was just it was like a ride. It was like Batman came out. In, you know, the year before, which I didn't see till VHS and then Dick Tracy came out and then we got it on VHS. And then also the Rocketeer came out the next year, which was amazing, but right. also yeah, doesn't yeah. have the legs of other things, of other <laughs> so films. True. I'm revealing my age. Basically, exactly I like can <laughs> tell someone's age, like plus or minus three years, if they know what the Rocketeer is. <laughs> ah, yeah. And we could have a whole other podcast about that. Another just great, yeah. you know, throwback film. When it's time to fight crime. Calling Dick Tracy. Calling Dick Tracy. He's your man. Tracy. 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 You mind if I call you Dick? Okay, boys, let's go. Hey, Tracy, Tracy, 
Hey everyone, just Kyle breaking into the conversation here to tell you about some of the people who help this show continue to go. Now, if you'd like to help support the show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in. That's, of course, greatly appreciated. Pretty Together is an independent podcast, so if you'd like to help out monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I also need to give a huge thank you to the God That's Good tier from Patreon. That's Alex, Barry, Christopher, David, Jack, Luis, Mika, Robert, Stephen, and Witty. All right, let's get back to the show. Everywhere I turn, it's Tracy, Tracy, Tracy. This summer, he's coming to a theater near you. I'm on my way. Dick Tracy. I guess the only last thing I'll say is kind of from my perspective, I think I've said this a few times here on this mini series, but I definitely recall the marketing. I remember seeing Dick Tracy everywhere, the commercials, like you said, in McDonald's, supermarket shelves. Like it was almost inescapable, the Dick Tracy marketing. So in my mind, I always thought that this movie was a far bigger, bigger success than it actually was. I saw it for the first time on home video, though. So it was a rental that my parents got and brought home. I watched it the one time and then never again until just a few weeks ago and before starting the season, I decided to sit down and watch it again. Uh, I have to say, like, I had positive memories of Dick Tracy from watching it as a kid. I remember the sets being so cool. I remember the action being pretty fun. I do remember the songs being catchy, even though I didn't really know who Stephen Sondheim was at the point at that point. And then uh, watching it as an adult was a whole different experience. But I will say, whether it's rose-colored glasses or not, I think that there is a lot that this movie does really well. So I'm kind of glad that there's a bit of a reappraisal than from what its initial reception was. Yeah, absolutely. I do think it's one of those films that over time, people have looked back on it to see where it was successful. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we'll get into this later, but financially, technically it did make um, yeah. you know, $160 million. It was by no means a bomb. It just yeah. underperformed from what they wanted it to be. Yeah. And where it becomes a bomb is that it cost about 50 million. They spent about 50 million on marketing and it only made a hundred domestically. So right. domestically, it technically did not make any money. And the 60 that it made was international. So that's why whenever you get into movie financing and box office, it can get tricky, but that's where it becomes a bomb, even though it was like one of the top 10 grossing films of the year. Plus, I always find that there's this weird, as they, as they like to call it, uh, Hollywood accounting that goes on where sometimes I'm always a little bit questioning of like, did this actually not make money or like, how are we actually calculating all these costs? But that's a conversation for another day. We don't need to get into the financials of, of filmmaking. Let me tell you, let's walk through how this movie even got made in the first place, because it kind of bounced around a bunch of different people, creators, stars, until it finally landed where it actually did. I do want to just give a quick shout out to the fact that this is by no means the first Dick Tracy adaptation. The comic, of course, came out in the early 1930s and actually starting in the late 1930s into the 1940s, there were these four Dick Tracy serials that were made. That's S E. R-I-A-L-S, A-L-S, serials. Think of them as TV shows because they're basically like 15 to 18 episodes of, that are about 15 to 30 minutes long, depending on, on what we're looking at. And uh, those were, you know, fairly successful. There's even a TV show that eventually got spun off from, from those starring the same actor. I watched two of them in preparation for this and thought they were completely fine. <laughs> I didn't think they were great, but they were completely fine. Uh, and then after those serials, there was four feature films that were made. The last one being, I think it's Dick Tracy versus Gruesome is what it's called. And that has Boris Karloff as the kind of the big bad in that movie. So there's some fun pulpy adaptations that you can see in the 30s and 40s. And then there's pretty much or there's really not anything as far as film goes uh, of Dick Tracy up until the mid 1970s where a Mr. Warren Beatty who loves Dick Tracy really kind of wants it to be his next project and I should you I should ask you Josh instead of me monologuing here too much do you know about the rest of the story after that <laughs> besides the mid 70s and it's Warren Beatty who's interested in it yeah so I um have tried to piece little bits together uh and mm -hmm. also I just want to speak back to that sort of 
sequence that you just mentioned of the comic strip, yep. 1931, and to the serial, to the B-movies. I also, it's also my understanding that there was a failed TV show where they filmed a pilot that didn't yeah. go. There didn't was go also, anywhere. I believe, a failed animated series that didn't go. The key here, though, is to remember how parallel this is to Batman. I think that's like a hmm. very important thing. And to remember that in 1931, Dick Tracy predates both Batman and Superman. So there is this sense that the character of Dick Tracy was created as one of the first sort of superhero type figures who had this rogues gallery of villains that all looked, you know, wacky and crazy and that he was fighting on the side of, you know, justice. And yeah. it was also kind of a big predate to like law procedurals and the detective shows that of course become big and uh, later on. Totally true. And I do have to say like, like the Dick Tracy comic strip still is running. Like you can go and see new Dick Tracy comic strips that are being produced. That's incredible. And it really does feel like that where it's like your three panels, but like you are thrust into the middle of a story. If you go there right now where you have to kind of read the 12 proceeding, it's even get a sense of what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And so it's, it's, it's important to remember that Dick Tracy was also wildly popular. My understanding is like very, very, very popular. So popular. I will say this so popular. In fact, that uh, I keep dropping this, but I am watching all of the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies currently. That's my little film challenge I gave to myself this year. They reference Dick Tracy all the time in right. that. And I'm talking like, we're talking uh, late 30s, early 40s. So the you know movie serials and stuff are being made. But like other media is talking about Dick Tracy. It's not yeah. just like its own special thing. Exactly. And so for us, it's impossible really to wrap our heads around how big it was because we all grew up most of us, with Superman and Batman. To your point of the gap, what happens in the 50s is Superman has a very successful TV show. And what happens in the 60s is Batman has a very successful TV show. That's true. And so then what happens in the 70s, 1978, is Superman the movie comes out. And it is so popular that Hollywood is saying, okay, superheroes could be a thing. Who can we make? Immediately, they hire the same writers from Superman, one of them, to start writing Batman. And they also ask that writer to start writing a Dick Tracy, is my understanding. That's true. Now it takes 10 years. A decade to make Batman. <laughs> a decade to make Batman. So. Without making this a Batman podcast, but it's important for context. It seems that around that time is when Warren Beatty, who grew up with Dick Tracy being you know, one of the most famous superhero type figures as a big leading man in Hollywood, it would make sense that he would gravitate or at least be asked to come be a part of that role. So that's like the a little setup that I wanted to give. I don't I want to toss it back to you. So no, I think I think that's great. I just as two little strands that we don't have to spend a lot of time on. I do find it interesting that it's Batman in particular who was and currently still is probably like the i'm gonna say most popular or the uh, the character that has seeped the most into the popular imagination like how many batman movies have there been made in like the past i'm just gonna say decade there's been a bunch of them tv shows merchandise comic books like you name it batman still kind of reigns number one and is yet is like kind of one of the most outlandish <laughs> superheroes and just uh, the rogues gallery that they have versus i'm just saying versus dick tracy who has a very creative set of foes that he goes after in a similar way that batman does but is, uh, tries to be grounded in a bit more reality rather than a guy wearing a bat suit running around and solving crime right it's interesting that it's batman that that captures the popular imagination for longer and more a more sustained amount of time yeah. And uh, again, I can go on and I will reference Batman probably a few more times in f framing Dick Tracy. But yeah, I, there's something about that. Batman being and not having any superpowers is, mm -hmm. I think, very important to knowing how that character can be reimagined over and over. Um, because mm -hmm. someone who has been orphaned and then deals with grief, granted, he has a lot of money, but how he deals with that and makes himself a better version of himself, I think is quite universal and can be reimagined. 
and modernized over and over again. And then you also get a couple smart, creative uh, people who take a great spin on it. Other studios and producers that give them the freedom to do that. A couple lucky breaks. And yeah, Batman has been the one that sort of keeps <laughs> staying in the zeitgeist. But you are right. So it's these two writers, Jim Cash and Jack Epps, who are commissioned to write this screenplay in the late 1970s. At that time, they're courting John Landis to be the director. And if you can imagine this, Clint Eastwood as Dick Tracy, like that's kind of the original concept. Um, They write two versions of the script. And according to producers, having not read them, uh, both of them are considered terrible. So they just did not like what they were doing. It was always set in the 1930s, though. That was kind of the the recurring thing through all of this gestation that they always wanted to set it in the 1930s specifically. That's fascinating. I find that very, yeah. very fascinating. Because one thing that's unique about Dick Tracy, and I was planning to bring this up later, but maybe I'll bring it up now. When you look at Superman and Batman, they are modernized versions of them. It's always placing them that's in true. contemporary time period and society. And that Seems to be a successful thing to do. James Bond also always does that. Yeah, always um, updating it. I would, I would hazard to yeah. say, maybe I'm wrong in this. I just think the the iconography of Dick Tracy somewhat prevents it from being developed too far past. I'm gonna just gonna say like the 1950s would maybe be like the latest time period that would make sense to me. Again, with like the fedora, the long trench coat, that's sort of this the style of of Dick Tracy. And then you have everything else also has this problem. Uh, like the properties you just mentioned also have this problem to a degree. But like Dick Tracy's most like advanced piece of technology is like the watch on his on his wrist that he can go right. to, which the Apple Watch that now like you know, everybody can get. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't although, seem as special uh, as what it was. Apparently in the serial, they did infuse more, you know, 1930s era sci-fi and gadgetry is my understanding, mm-hmm. which is it's also true. why in the film, they at least do the hidden recorder in the water cooler with mumbles. But yeah, I think right, they right, tried right. to do like a James, pre-James Bond. They tried to do like a gadget. Batman too, a gadgetry thing. But yeah, it seems like it, it, that is also very disconnected from the strip. So audiences yeah. didn't um, always like it. So directors and writers come on and fall out and different actors are asked to uh, work on it. But ultimately, what we eventually get to is that it's Walter Hill, of all people, who comes on board to be like, I'm going to be the director of this. Um, they hire Warren Beatty to be Dick Tracy. And um, they work on it and they work on it. And wouldn't you know it, this is not really a surprise if anyone knows Warren Beatty, but uh, pretend it's your surprise when creative differences arise between Warren Beatty and his director. (laughs) This happened on literally everything that Warren Beatty worked on. The biggest argument that was going on is that Walter Hill wanted this to be a grounded, gritty, dark version of Dick Tracy. And Warren Beatty was like, no, I think it should be pulpy, but it needs to be bright and colorful and emulate the comic strip style. Um, So he's had a very different idea of what the tone was going to be. And so when Walter Hill finally has enough of dealing with Warren Beatty and quits the project, Paramount is like, hey, do you think you would want to direct it? And he's like, okay, I guess I can do that too. And then eventually it actually does end up at Disney to help uh, the budget and to distribute the film. And it officially gets greenlit in 1988 with the funny uh, proviso here that that Beatty was supposed to keep the budget to $25 million, which eventually does balloon to 50. So maybe this movie would look, be looked at a lot more fondly uh, by Disney at the very least, if he had kept it to the 25 million, because at least it would have looked better as far as uh, the amount of money it got. But yes, so it starts production in 1988 and uh, they start making the film. Now, do you know when they, um, I actually don't know this. I forgot to actually look this up. So I'm going to ask you, do you know when he approaches Sondheim to start to write the songs? So I don't know that. However, what I do know is that, and this is good context for everyone, that prior to Dick Tracy, Warren Beatty directed, starred in, and wrote a big Academy Award winning film called right. Reds with Diane Which we Keaton. did do an entire episode on. Oh, you did? Okay, For the great, show, yes. Because... Sondheim wrote the theme song for that. And I think Sondheim wrote the score to that film. Is well, that correct? N- he, no, he really okay. only did write the theme song. There's okay. another person who did most of the other scoring. Great. So Sondheim wrote that song. You've talked about it on another episode, which 
clearly yes. I need to listen to. And uh, so my assumption is that Warren Beatty and Sondheim had some sort of friendship or were at least cordial with each other. And when you look at 1930s songs, Sondheim obviously makes the most sense for someone mm -hmm. to approach. And if Warren Beatty's already friends with them. Also, if you look at the film itself, Warren Beatty only brought in the best of the best across yeah. the board. So this is something that we keep coming back to. Yeah. But like we have some pretty big actors at the time coming in for three minutes of screen time. Like it's pretty yeah. remarkable there. But even behind the scenes, he has some of the best people working for him. Everything. And you have to remember, he just made this huge epic Reds, you know, nominated uh, one Oscars. So it also makes sense that that's how he operates now. Right. He, mm -hmm. he has a vision and he knows how to achieve it. And if you have a connection to Sondheim to write the songs, that's who you should ask. So, yeah, I don't know when when uh, he reached out to him. Uh, I, too, was trying to find a little more info on that, but couldn't quite right. find it on the Internet. Well, what I will say is that just this is really just based on how Sondheim writes about both experiences in the book. Look, I made a hat. Reds seem to be a bit more of a contentious affair as far mm -hmm. as like how the writing process was. Warren Beatty made him rewrite a bunch of stuff because <laughs> he didn't like the first theme that he wrote for the, for him. So there was a lot of back and forth and it doesn't seem like that's the case here. And he keeps mentioning like how fun it was to write these songs. But we're kind of going back into his wheelhouse. We're getting to write pastiche yeah. songs. He's familiar with it. He knows who he wants to emulate. He really understands the assignment to be able to go and kind of knock out these five songs. Actually, I should say... Originally it was four, and he asked, he's asked to write a fifth one because Warren Beatty uh, rejects the Madonna song that was supposed to be in this movie. Do you know which was the one that was Back in added? Business. Oh, okay. Which Back Madonna in business is all, ends up not yeah. singing. Uh, and then it all comes together here and is released. And I would say it's not like this movie... Actually, I'm going to wait for the responses here. Let's get into our responses here now so now we're watching it you know all these years later what is your what are your feelings about this movie i know that i am biased and nostalgic i think this movie is very successful from a bias and nostalgic standpoint when i try to remove that as best i can and watch it as a filmmaker i think it is still incredibly successful and the shortest way i can put it is to make a movie requires a director to have a very clear vision and communicate that vision out to, in this case, hundreds, if not thousands of people, and then bring it all together. And mm -hmm. when I watch this film, it feels like one clear vision beginning to end. I was expecting when I rewatched it to have the script or the plot get clunky. But to be honest, when I rewatched it, the script was really, really tight and really moved quick. Like in the first 10 to 15 minutes, we've met our hero, like set up the love triangle, met the villain. The villain has killed multiple people. And then literally, I think in like 15, 20 minutes in, our hero is arresting the villain. Like, and there yeah. has not been a moment that a scene that doesn't end with some sort of twist or surprise. And that is just a really clever, smart, bold way to start a film, have the hero and the villain, like have the hero succeed right away. But then of course mm -hmm. the, the villain gets out of jail and all those things, but it continues to, to the end. The script is smart and fast. And it, I, it is such a really interesting comparison to Reds because Reds is, gosh, I want to say it's over three hours. It's a long movie that that movie is to this being an hour and 45 with credits that you're right, just moves at a very quick pace. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I, I don't want to say they don't make them like they used to, but they don't because <laughs> uh, it's it's um, it, it is what it is. It's a noir. It's um, there's, of course, melodrama in it. Uh, and uh, it walks that line between, you know, taking itself seriously enough, but still having fun. And I'm not saying it's the greatest script ever written, but I'm saying it's from a craft perspective. It is very, very well written and just moves in a really fun, quick way. Yeah, just I have a blast with this movie. I was actually a little bit shocked at how much I enjoyed watching this after a couple of decades away from seeing it from the first 
seen it for the first time. For all the reasons you say, I think it knows exactly what it's trying to be. I think the production design adds to the movie. I think every actor knows, you know, when to choose scenery and when to like be melodramatic or be serious. The music from Sondheim really does add to the ambiance of the, of this movie. And I think it doesn't overstay its welcome. I think it's perfectly as long as it needs to be. It doesn't need to be a two hour plus film. And I know that this is completely just a, a me thing. But it was so fun to go back to, to when movies had color in them. Yeah. Because one of <laughs> it seems to me that a lot of comic book movies nowadays have to be like drab and gray and browns. And like, it's just not even fun to look at most of the time. Yeah. And very occasionally that does fit the tone they're going for. But more often than not, it's just like, I just think it's lazy color grading. So to go back to this thing where it's like, no, we know that we are from the comic book pages and we want to present that to you in a film and i think it knocks it out of the park in that regard yeah i mean the production design and the color choices and the color design across the whole film is so remarkable a couple things i want to point out you've mentioned it before everyone knows this the way that he filmed the the cityscapes are all matte painting i think it might be the mm -hmm. most matte painters ever used in a movie or something like that and Literally, the opening, the opening shot, or you know, after a couple inserts of him grabbing the watch and the hat, you get this exterior shot of his apartment, and you see Dick Tracy through the window leave his apartment, and then it pans across the whole city, and this is the reveal of the whole city, and it is stunning and beautiful, comic book come to life, and all that, but. The camera choices is also so great because instead of just panning across the city and then like cross dissolving. He pans directly over to Kid getting something out of a trash can. It's one shot that pans over and connects you from one part of the town to the next, which is just great, smart, intentional filmmaking. And then he mm -hmm. does that again when he and Tess are walking out of the diner and it's the first time we're going to go to the Club Ritz and meet Madonna. Is there? And it's also the first song, which is actually a brilliant moment, but it pans across and then zooms in on the Club Ritz. And so... There was intention in every moment in this film, which is also very film noir. And I just was blown away by that production work, color, and the camera, the camera work. Yeah, I, I think that's all top notch. I, the, I, the one thing I think is inescapable, and this isn't really a criticism, but just something that I think has to be acknowledged is like, it doesn't very much feel like a late 80s, early 90s film. A, it's being shot on film, but B, it just has that, uh, or in the limitations of what they could and could not do. It's the same yeah. when you go back to that 1978 Superman film, right? It's not going to be as special effects laden as say like a modern retelling of that same story. So you can tell like these, yes, we, these are all sets. These are all matte paintings. I know exactly, exactly yeah. how fictional this film is. But again, a lot of that is intentional at the same time. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because it does feel like a film of that specific time period and there's no escaping it. And that's also why I try my best when I'm watching movies to let them be what they're supposed to be. Same thing when I'm listening to songs or, uh, or mm -hmm. for Broadway for that matter, right? I want to go in with an open mind that is open to what the filmmaker or the artist intended sometimes i'm more successful at that than others but going into this knowing okay this is a 90s movie it's a disney movie it's a warren Beatty film it's a comic book movie it is of course stuck in that time period but i think within that it works very very well yeah so yes absolutely huge caveat i don't expect anyone listening to this who hasn't seen it to go back and expect a christopher nolan film or a, a right. marvel movie <laughs> with paintings um, really the only two negative criticisms i have not enough for me not to love this movie i really did like my rewatch of this there's really two criticisms i have the first is the one that i've become a broken record on so everyone take a shot because i think i've said it on every episode this this mini series i really don't like the danny elfman score to this movie i don't totally agree. it really feels like a derivative work from batman it's like his first tries or first drafts from batman he's just like oh, i'll just put them here into dick tracy it just doesn't feel intentional to what the rest of the movie is doing i totally totally agree it feels it also feels very disconnected from the songs and i know yeah, in yeah. fact i did hear or read somewhere that sondheim was asked to write the score for this film as well yeah and he said he, no <laughs> yeah i didn't even consider it rightfully so 
Um, mm-hmm. Like you said, he works too slow. He's like, I just would never have been able to make it in time. And if you're, if you, if you don't want a director telling you what to do, don't score their movie. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, with my background in music and film, I would score movies, short films and stuff when I first moved to LA. And it's, it's its own experience. Cause a, like I said, a director needs to know what they want and they can do that well with camera usually. But once you get into music, it can get, it can get very tricky. Um, yeah, but for sure. about the Danny Elfman score, I felt very disconnected. I think it does start to make it reminiscent of Batman. Also, it just has all what has become that very repetitive Danny Elfman sound. Yeah. No discredit to Danny Elfman. But I will say at the, the very, very end of the movie, like the last shot is this sweeping romantic score that I would not be surprised if someone else wrote because it is <laughs> sure, okay. perfect <laughs> and sounds amazing and sounds of the era and the period and the tone that I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Danny Elfman was off you know, writing any number of other things. And they had one of his arrangers or people do additional music because it was like spot on and didn't sound like Danny Elfman. And I was like, whoever wrote Uh, this should have scored the film. He Hans Zimmered it. He just outsourced it to somebody else. Um, (laughs) And the other big one I have is, or the other big criticism I have is this is somewhat, I would say, due to the time period but i think it is more so just not in warren Beatty's skill set which is the action sequences i, I don't know I, they, I just don't feel that they are captured as well as they could be um i don't think they're even that well conceived as far as sequences go again this is not necessarily like a huge action piece either but the handful of times where people are jumping from you know rooftop to car or yeah, uh, you know, in the warehouse and stuff like that. It's just like it's very perfunctory. It doesn't feel as energized as some of the other parts of the film. Like like the musical sequences, I think are filmed beautifully. Yeah, filmed and edited and just the musical sequences. And I would love to talk about those uh, in a moment. Mm-hmm. The action, I would I would agree. However, I would add the caveat of I think he was making a detective noir film where yeah. action is not inherently the point and then the other thing i would say is go back and watch batman 1988 true enough (laughs) and tell me how good those action sequences actually are Mm because they're super minimal and i think it is a product of the time and honestly for me when i go back and watch batman which was my favorite movie for years and years i unfortunately can compare it to contemporary batman movies and see it being not as action packed whereas dick mm-hmm. tracy i'm like yeah it feels like a mobster detective movie <laughs> you know like right. I, i'm i'm so i'm more forgiving but i i do agree with you let's talk about how the songs integrate into the plot here then where do you want to start with that is there anything specific that you wanted to mention can i actually just quickly before we move on to that make one yeah, yeah. critique on my end the one thing that jumped out as uh, like that I was critical of was I did notice there was this moment where big boy is throughout the whole film. What's fascinating about him as a villain is that he's actually really trying not to be too bad. Like his main thing is he wants to buy (laughs) off the lawyers, buy off the detectives. He wants to bring all the mobsters together. It's actually a very funny, fascinating villain mobster to have where he's really just trying to organize everyone so that he doesn't have to like do criminal things other than run his casino but he's very adamant do not kill tracy he is saying that over and over again it's sort of a main plot point where he's preventing everyone else from killing tracy and then suddenly it just switches and he says there's a scene where he's saying you have to kill tracy i i wanted you know generals but i got footmen and it really comes out of nowhere that he suddenly switches and so my guess is my understanding is that they cut 15 minutes from Warren Beatty's, you know, original cut and script. And I'm guessing there was 15 minutes in there that might have helped with that transition. But sure. it is the only jarring thing that happens where he's been saying, don't kill Tracy the whole movie. And then suddenly it's like, why haven't you guys killed him? So that's my big critique. Other than that, uh, you know. Uh, I'll I'll keep defending this film probably more than I should. Yeah, let's talk about the music here then. How, how did you want to, or what did you want to say first about how the music integrates into the movie? Yeah, so the the songs. This was the first time I watched the film uh, thinking about the music uh, because when I watched it in the past, it was not on my radar. At all. It was at all. It was just a piece of the film. And now for me, where I'm at in my life, writing uh, musical films and also just thinking how do songs work 
within filmmaking? How can, what are the films that have used songs and music, you know, in the best ways? Again, very different than Broadway and the theater. I was, I was very excited to watch it through that lens. And I was actually very pleasantly surprised that I thought the songs actually really do work mm -hmm. right in tandem with the script and the story and the characters. I'm going to try to quickly kind of go across a couple, just starting with Sooner or Later is the first tune. And what the way it's teed up is specifically in the dialogue where it's Tracy and Tess are coming out of the diner. It's clear that they are together. Tracy says, there's as much chance of me getting behind a desk as me getting a new girlfriend. Q. Sooner or later, you're going to be mine. It's like a right, right, perfect right. <laughs> dialogue toss to a song that is setting up the love triangle. And I was like, oh, this isn't a musical, but that's kind of like a musical. Like that was a mm -hmm. perfect tee up. And so I thought that was really great to see how they were connected. And then, um, yeah, and I, I think what I keep have gone, I, what I've reiterated here too through this miniseries is how, while this is not a traditional musical where, like, you know, someone steps out and sings an entire song about their inner feelings or it pushing the plot forward, what they do instead is they, they take little s snippets and, like, really use this, um, the spice to, yeah. to the movie to do that commentary, like you just said. Yeah. And, and it happens multiple times. And I know all the other, episodes will go deeper so i hopefully i'm not mm -hmm. uh, spoiling anything or stepping on anyone else's toes but from a filmmaking standpoint of how do we get these to work together is more what i'm commenting on as opposed to you know the songwriting and and then similarly there's there is basically a reprise of sooner or later that happens when tracy goes in it's actually sort of a uh, I think it's the fake arrest when he walks in, but it's literally on the line, which is the bridge. She sings, no one I've kissed ever fights me again. And the last scene was where they kissed. And right as she sings that, the editor has the two of them make eye contact. And so it's this mm -hmm. very specific, like I'm singing the thing that is a callback to the scene that just happened and the, the relationship we currently have. So again, I was just like, oh, okay, this is like a reprise and a moment that's, that's commenting on what we're seeing and the evolution. So I, I thought that was great. More comes in and the first time you see it, she is in rehearsal and Big Boy is just like <laughs> screaming at her, <laughs> wanting more as she sings about right. more. Just and it's in like a devil of a stage manager. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, but then it's also cross cut with, uh, Tracy interrogating mumbles. And one could say he's also asking for more out of, you know, the interrogation. But what's, what I, I found great is that then when more comes back, what I would consider the reprise for more is during this big fight out, it's this big climax that she is singing about wanting more and all that. And she is the one who pulled all the strings that led to this big shootout while she is singing this big show-stopping number. And it builds perfectly where it's cross-cutting to the point where like you are hearing the Tommy guns in the background of her singing with all the dancers. So I just thought it's a similarly this great build of like this character who wants more, and of course her as a character wants more, and that's why she's really the one behind yeah, the yeah. scenes, trying to get her freedom, trying to get love and all those things. And so it was beautiful to see how that became, you know, juxtaposed with the Tommy guns that she orchestrated. A side note about more, again, you might go into this in the other episode, but the intro from the song that is not in the film, she talks about, uh, the line is, you know, I had plenty of nothing, and now I got plenty of plenty, but look at what I got to go with them, with it. That's right. Yeah. And it's not in the film, but it's actually really important because what does she have to go with it? She's trapped by big boy. She's trapped in this bigger world. And so even that intro is speaking to her. And you can only assume that she came from nothing and is now trapped in the mob. So it actually sort of sets her up nicely. And then at the very end of the tune, she says, you know, there's one thing you miss and it's more, which is I say clearly a point to the fact that she wants freedom and love and she wants more. Yeah. She wants the real things. I'm sure I forget if you talked about that in that episode, but so I thought it does serve as a nice song. I would even go so far as to say like what can sound like a, a song that's tossed off and really just there for background, the um, live alone and like it, I think does a really great job of like, of, of commenting on the fact that both the kid and Dick Tracy are dealing with this idea of like, well, I'm living alone right now. And like, that's fine, but almost protesting too much. Correct. <laughs> so this well, really weird like crooner song that I think is a little bit deeper than what most people probably think of when they first 
listen to it or half listen to it. Yeah. And, and Live Alone Like It is the next tune in the film. And it's actually Tess is the one who basically says it. It's her dialogue mm-hmm. that tees it up because right when the song ends, they're sitting there in the car and Tracy says, you know, I live alone, you live alone. And she goes, I like living alone. I, I'm not the lonely type. And that is their whole theme of Tracy trying to build up the courage to propose to her. And so once again, I was I was like ready for that to just be a radio song in the background. And then suddenly there it is in the dialogue. You know, live alone right, and like right. it. And then I like to live alone. And then that becomes a cute, you know, classic 90s uh, tight script of like living alone and ultimately building the courage to propose. So that too, which is <laughs> sort of this background song, I felt was like, no, there it is in the dialogue. Like that's that's why it's there. Not to get too biographical, but uh, that would eventually be uh, Warren Beatty in two of years. Course. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> still in his bachelor days here in the early 90s. Yeah, exactly. And And I do think, and I know you did, another episode about that tune. And I do think Mm -hmm. it is written with that Sondheim irony, right? It's someone who is saying, live alone, like it. It's great. I can do all these things. But then it's not really (laughs) what maybe they want or is best when, you know, they're confronted with the the option of falling in love in this case. And then, yeah, going on to what can you lose? It's just perfectly timed. It is like cued right the lyrics start right when Te- when Tracy says Tess went out of town and he realizes she left him. It cues what can you lose, and it's just perfectly in sync again, teed up with the dialogue. And even you know it you know similarly has the lyric the clues she chose to ignore. Um, with so much to win, there's too much to lose. As as it's showing Tess sort of arrive at I think her mother's house. So once again, it feels very much directly connected to the story we're watching. But because it's not a musical, most people probably don't pay attention to it. But I was very pleasantly surprised to see how connected it was. I mean, I think that's the kind of the cool part about all of this is that while not a musical, still kind of has these musical theater principles. Yeah. And uh, as we have seen time and time again, Sondheim isn't really one to be like, write a love song or just write, uh, yeah. you know, a crooner song. He has to like tie it to character somehow. So I'm sure you've read the script or, or talked with Warren Beatty a bit about like, okay, where is this going to be located in yeah. in the plot? And then was able to write something a little bit more deep. Yeah, exactly. And and then again, the way just they edited it and brought it together, it was just perfectly locked in there and, and mm-hmm. even what can you lose the scene coming right out of it is breathless meeting with tracy where she's basically the first line she says i think is i shouldn't be talking to a cop implying she has something to lose you know even though i think that becomes when she really tries to get him to run away with her or profess his love for her yeah and then of course back in business is very straightforward that's makes sense that it was an added song but you know it also works perfect and once again it's uh, queued up by, I think, uh, Big Boy says the line, we're back in business. And it queues. That's right. Uh, like, it's directly. I, I just think it's so hilarious that so many of these songs, like, at least three of them, have, like, multiple versions that have been recorded of them. Like, yeah. of all of Sondheim's projects, it's really interesting to me that this Dick Tracy that has people keep coming back to this well to perform them. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I was actually, as I started Googling it and sort of researching it to come on the podcast, I was surprised to see, oh, there's Liza Minnelli singing it. There's, you know, all these other covers. And I mean, of course, sooner or later won the Oscar. But um, yeah, I I too was pleasantly surprised to see these songs Mm -hmm. have had have had a life as Sondheim songs. Anything else you want to say about the movie specifically? The other thing I was going to say, well, I guess two things. The one thing I wanted to say to wrap up the song section is for myself as a songwriter and screenwriter and filmmaker, I often find myself trying to find what is the in for the song and any songwriters Mm -hmm. out there for stage is the same. And so I thought in a Sondheim stage show, it's much harder to see where those kernels might be coming from because it's so much more integrated in so many of his work and so much of his work. But so it was Mm -hmm. just really fun for me to see like, oh, here's a script that was definitely written first. And this is where that kernel is being pulled from. And so it was really just a joy for me to see because it's something that I've been studying. And as I'm writing scripts on my own, I'm always like playing between writing dialogue and then I'll write one line and be like, oh, that could be a song. Okay make a note of that and then go explore that song. So it was just really lovely. And I think for Sondheim, 
fans out there and songwriters out there, it can also be a great exercise into sort of seeing like, oh, where did this kernel come from and where did it, uh, you know, what did it become? For sure. Um, I, I think this just calls into how great and how valued uh, Sondheim had with his collaborators. Like he really wanted to be able to work with, with everyone on the project to make it the best it possibly could be. To that end, yeah, him trying to find that kernel with what other people have produced so that he can make his best work is really fun to kind of unpack. Yeah. And even if they are just sort of, as he said, fun, simple songs to write or easy songs to write, however you phrase it, it's still fun to explore. Mm -hmm. And then the one other thing I want to say about the film, which is about Warren Beatty as a director, is that whenever a director is making a film, they have to make these decisions, like I uh, mentioned earlier. And I was going to say how, you know, when Tim Burton made Batman, he made this very intentional decision to make it dark, to make the bat suit black, which it had never been right. before that. It was always gray or blue. And he was very um, intentionally saying, this is the type of Batman I'm going to make. And he also, in interviews, has said things like, I needed to understand why someone would dress up like a bat. And his decision was, this guy is probably not very intimidating on his own, so he needs to make himself bigger and darker, um, which is different than other Batman since. But he had to find his way into that psychology and into that world. And it makes sense that Warren Beatty was like, OK, how do I get into this world? Uh, what do I want to say? And it's fascinating to hear that another director was like, let's go dark. And Warren Beatty was like, no, we got to yeah. go colorful because... There's this other thing, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but my understanding is the yellow trench coat and the yellow hat went back to the comics. And I can see how, like, if I had to make a movie where the main character has to wear a yellow trench coat, I can't put that character in a dark world. But if I put them in a world where everyone wears different colored coats and different colored cars and literally everything in this film has pops of color, the street lamps are green, the rails on stoops are like right, different right. colors, the window frames are purple and some it, it's there's color everywhere, which is pulling from the comic strip. But I think it also makes perfect sense to as an in for a filmmaker to be like, what world would a detective in a yellow coat and yellow hat live? Oh, it's a colorful <laughs> world. So um, I, I think it's regardless of if other people have issues with it, I think it's a successful choice and it and it makes sense to, to find your way there as a filmmaker. I just think it sets it, it itself apart and kind of proves the fact that Warren Beatty himself was a bit of an auteur. Like he had a very specific vision. He stuck to that vision for better or for worse, I guess, depending on your point of view of the film. It is his artistic statement on this is doesn't look like uh, every other comic book movie made. So to that, I'm going to give a huge congratulations to him. Yeah. And again, can't speak to whether or not he was nice or kind <laughs> or any of those things as directors will often swing I between. Almost guarantee he wasn't, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to assume that as well. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, so yeah, not defending anyone, but it did achieve a specific mm -hmm type of film. And I can see sort of the path to those decisions being made. And that is something that I'm always fascinated in as a filmmaker to sort of try to work backwards and be like, oh, how did we get here in a successful movie or an right. unsuccessful movie? So um, like we kind of mentioned at the beginning, this movie is semi considered a failure at the box office. Again, not a bomb, but does not make as much money as what Disney was hoping for. Critically speaking, I would say that this was a mixed reaction. It was not like outright like we hate this movie. There was quite a few critics at the time who really championed it. Uh, I've already invoked his name, but Roger Ebert was a big fan of this movie. He just thought that it was such a unique looking film and he congratulated the uh, the dead it takes to pull this off and make it feel so seamless but there's just as many critics out there that just felt it was like again warren Beatty being pretentious showing off unconvincing performances a little bit too hammy you know all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah. so but mixed i would say it was a mixed reaction since that time as i've been saying at least from I guess my bubble that I'm in, I've seen more reappraisals starting to happen in the last few years where I feel like more people are coming back to this and being like, oh, I always thought this was bad or I was led to believe that this was a, a huge boondoggle of a film. And it, it, it really isn't that when you actually sit down and watch yeah. it. Yeah, I totally agree as we you know touched on earlier. And I watched the Siskel and Ebert review, you know, 
uh, mm-hmm. yesterday, I think. And yeah, they were generally positive, um, one more so than the other, but it, it definitely wasn't a pan. Yellow hat and coat. The film is glorious to look at and a true invention and individual performers, notably Pacino, are first rate. I just wish the crime story were a little tighter and that Beatty had played Tracy as more of a hero. Otherwise, it is a truly original creation. I just want to have one point here. First of all, I don't think yellow hats and coats are period clothes. I think that that period exists only in the Chester Gould comic strip that Dick Tracy is based on. But apart from that, Dick Tracy in the comics and in this movie is kind of uh, uh, something for the others to ricochet off of. Dick Tracy, to me, was always the least interesting character in the comic strip because he was always surrounded by these weird-looking, bizarre creatures. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this movie is the use of makeup, especially in that opening poker scene and some of the right. other scenes where these really weird, strange looking people come along, like Dustin Hoffman playing Mumbles, right. or a big boy uh, Caprice. Caprice, whatever his name is. Yeah. The, the Al Pacino inside that makeup and inside that costume uh, really steals the show. It's a fabulous performance. It is great. But what I like most about the movie was how it creates an entirely different world for us to look at. And what I'd like to do right what now this is take does... a promote though uh is this infamous memo that jeffrey katzenberg releases to disney employees about how they're going to change how they make movies going forward this was this infamous thing that has since the time been printed in full on the internet i'm not going to go through the entire thing but uh, here's a small little sample of it that this is from the uh, la times story on it Movie stars are bad for business. This is what Katzenberg was writing. Unreasonable salaries coupled with giant participations comprise a win-win situation for the talent and a lose-lose situation for us. It results in us getting punished for failure and having no upside to success. Uh, Anyways, so he kind of goes scorched earth here and really moves Disney into going for uh, like non- recognizable filmmakers that they can mold to the way that they want movies made a better way to think about this is like starting to do producer led filmmaking rather than director made filmmaking is kind of the result of of dick tracy at the walt disney studios yeah and that memo my understanding is it was a 28 page memo it also by the way is the inspiration for cameron crowe to write jerry Maguire's uh memo in right. that script but yeah it's this big sort of declaration that we need to do things differently. I know that also within that memo, he does say things like, we should all be proud of the achievement that Dick Tracy is from like, we made a movie, feel good about it. Like, yeah, I think he tried to like make people feel like we we pulled it off, but it is far outshadowed by his true feelings, which is we need to change things moving forward. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's sort of interesting because on one hand, the memo is is you know relatively prophetic and sort of does predict the way that a lot of studios do shift and 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 make films but also you know going back to you know for lack of a better example is, is Batman is what they did was they found a young director in Tim Burton who was relatively unknown that gave it his all right and then they did the same mm-hmm. thing with Christopher Nolan he was young right out of you know, one or two, three, technically three movies, they bring him in. And so it's about like finding a great filmmaker, but that is still on the rise uh, and and maybe has something to prove as opposed to this like yeah, auteur I mean, who has full control over everything. 100%. This is exactly the, the Marvel model from the past at least yeah. decade, right? It's like, who's an indie director that's done some interesting work, usually like one, maybe two films. We can A, hire them for cheap and kind of tell them what to do. Um, but we know they're competent. They can actually make yep. a movie. So let's just get them and bring them on here. Yeah, Instead of and, going after, say, like a uh, like a Spielberg um, or a Christopher Nolan now, <laughs> like that level of name. Exactly. And so it is interesting how, it, you know, we can analyze or, you know, look back, but how just the fact that we mentioned like this longevity that Batman has had, uh, whereas as opposed to, you know, something like Dick Tracy that just sort of is, you know, is a blip, mm-hmm. so to speak. Although yeah. there is more to that story that I think uh, you well, want yeah, to get Well, thank into. you for teeing me up here. So for <laughs> that, that blip, some out there might be thinking, well, why haven't they tried to make another Dick Tracy movie? And there's a lot of answers to that. Number one, there was, had this movie been successful at the box office, like, like smashed records at the box office, there was already a sequel that was teed up, ready to go. Like they were kind of thinking long term. They kind of knew where they wanted to go. But because it underperforms, Disney's like, 
we are not interested in making anything Dick Tracy related. Warren Beatty is like, well, I love Dick Tracy, so I'm going to retain the rights to it. And also, actually, yeah, also, I it's my understanding, sorry to cut you off, it's my understanding that we skipped over this. Warren Beatty purchased the rights in 1985. So Correct. I think he was brought onto the project, like we said, in late 70s. But then as it was moving around, he bought the rights. So he actually controlled it going mm-hmm. into production, which gave him even more leverage. More control. And more control, which for those of you out there who don't know, the one who owns the rights is the one who can green... You know, dictate uh, yeah, how dictate. it works. Yeah, yeah. Now... I'm not going to get into the weeds of this because it even confuses me to a certain extent. Because you're right that he buys the rights. There was another company that thought that they had film rights to make more Dick Tracy movies. This eventually gets taken to court to, to settle, which Warren Beatty ultimately wins. But here's the long and short of it. Essentially, what Warren Beatty needs to do in order to retain the film rights to make more Dick Tracy films is he has to make something that involves Dick Tracy once every, I think it's 15 years. <laughs> it's a long time, but he has to make something so that he, so that it resets the clock, so to speak. This is why, and I recommend literally everyone stop what they are doing right now and go and watch these. There is two television specials that you can go and see right now each are about 30 minutes long that star warren Beatty as dick tracy being interviewed so it is not warren Beatty being interviewed it is dick tracy being interviewed wink wink (laughs) that is what is happening it is i'm just looking it up so it's the dick tracy special from 2009 and then there's another one called the dick tracy special tracy zooms in from 2023, so just of last year. And I'm not going to, but if anyone ever finds me in public and wants to sit down over a drink for an hour, I will tell you (laughs) everything about these because these are simultaneously performance art, so bad it's good, so good it's bad. Like I don't don't even know how to frame it because it is so bizarre (laughs) watching these two specials. I don't know if you have anything that you want to actually say about them. I am literally, I think the word is flabbergasted uh, to <laughs> to come across them and watch them because there is no way to really wrap your head around it because like you said, what it is, is I'll give a little more context. The first one in 2009 is filmed at Disney Studios. It's like this whole scripted thing where he arrives in a car and then sits down with Leonard Maltin and there's actors that have these little bits and then he he is Dick Tracy and is interviewed and is uh, talking and it's just this bizarre little like sketch. It feels like an SNL sketch or something like that. Yeah. But it is it is Warren Beatty doing this. He he wrote but can them. I, can I just <laughs> say that it feels like and I don't know if you agree with this. In both of them I feel like both times they have maybe 15 minutes of material that they have to stretch to 30. Like, there's some yeah. awkward, awkward moments that happen yeah. in them. And it also feels... And then the fact that there was one in 2023. Last year, they did a similar one, but they used Zoom and stuff. And it's a very fascinating, I guess, glimpse into the ego of a super Hollywood person that is Warren Beatty, a one of a kind Hollywood person, but also not unique when it comes to egos in Hollywood, that he just has this connection to this character. He clearly enjoys playing him. Like there is this right. bittersweet, when you sort of get past the oddity of it, of like, what is going on? He is really enjoying it. And there's this bittersweetness that I'm kind of like, I kind of want him. <laughs> I wish he could have made more. I wish he could have lived in yeah, this world more. But- but then that's he apologizes. The weird part of it. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, that's the weird part of it now is that like, so he's done these two specials and I, I, I guess I'm just confronted with the fact of like, but then what, what, but what are you actually doing with the rights? Like you could just yeah. make a movie rather than thinking about making a movie. And I don't know if this, if the trip or the, the hurdle here is like, is he truly considering himself continuing to be Dick Tracy? I know or, it's, it's or bizarre. He's trying to find someone to to replace him, and he just doesn't want to. I think I don't. I just don't know. Right, and because what normally happens again for context for everyone out there, normally one person will keep the rights, whether it's to Batman or whomever. But then they'll just 
let the next producer or filmmaker or studio pay them to mm -hmm. make the movies and then they just get a paycheck without doing anything. Or if they're a producer who's active, they'll just be involved in all of them. Like James Bond, uh, Barbara Bro Broccoli is the producer and that family is on the rights and they're very involved in all of those movies. It's the same family people who have made all of them. By the way, I only found this out recently and I thought someone was joking and I looked it up. The vegetable is named after them, not the other way around. <laughs> wow. I did not know Isn't that. Isn't that so crazy? Thank you. It's wild. <laughs> thank you for that. All that to say, I don't know what Warren Beatty is doing, but, and we can talk more about the special, but the thing that is interesting is that it's to my understanding is that Dick Tracy goes into the public domain in 2026. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that's accurate or not? I, I mean, that would make sense because I think that's, yeah, 95 years roughly from the character. So like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the end game is here. My suspicion is that as with everything, there's like these little like clauses and like oddities which is like Dick Tracy is going to go into the public domain, but maybe like the yellow fedora or like that type of thing yeah, is not some sort of like Mickey Mouse is, thing, right? It's like um, if anyone knows, like anyone out there right now could make a Wizard of Oz movie that that book is in the public domain, but you cannot use the ruby red slippers. Exactly. That was an MGM yeah. in the movie invention by them so they will yeah. sue you if you try and use the ruby red slippers and that could be the case and which is why in both specials he's in the yellow trench coat and right. yellow fedora and he talks about them regularly so maybe there is some sort of thing he's trying to protect there i will say the other thing that i discovered in googling this is that there is i think just this past april 2024 there is a brand new comic book called tracy number right. one and it is very much the creators say we were we're trying to do a Dick Tracy what Frank Miller did for Batman Year One. It is more realistic, darker, gritty, and so it is sort of interesting. I would I wouldn't be surprised if that team is intentionally making that for public domain and rights usage, so that we may very well get some sort of a yeah. you know Batman Begins or version of of Dick Tracy. I I'm gonna call my shot, and there's nothing. That is going to support this theory. My guess is that there is another Dick Tracy property, whether it's a movie, TV show, whatever, anime that happens within the next 10 years. Whether Warren Beatty is involved in any of that, I have no idea. But, but I, I do think I predict that there's going to be something uh, that comes out. Um, yeah, I totally agree. So we'll see. I totally agree because also you have people, you know, my age who are nostalgic for Dick Tracy, like you and I are, who are now in positions to greenlight things. And I'm sure there are lots of producers or studio executives and writers out there who would love to, to take a stab at it. So I for sure totally agree with that prediction. However, tying it back, I think there will not be great songs in that version. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my, that's my disappointment. Yeah, Because Breathless <laughs> is not from the comic strip. That character is that's new right. that was a, an original. original right? And therefore, he would retain the rights to her. While I think I now think Sondheim is in, is should or or tunes like his should be linked to Dick Tracy forever. I don't know in the reboot if they will be. We do need to wrap up, but the there's I guess to finish on this note is just like Sondheim in the movies um, throughout this podcast or the, throughout the history of this podcast, we have kind of touched on some of the moments that. Sondheim wrote music. He did write the score to Stavisky, for instance. He wrote songs for other films like The 7% Solution, this movie, of course. I do want to mention that the 90s could have been this very interesting, like, I don't know, resurgence of Sondheim because he wrote the songs for this. He writes two songs for The Birdcage, which you only really hear part of one. And he writes all all of the songs for an unproduced movie called here no sing out loud i think is what it was called but he wrote an entire musical score or mu like so music and lyrics yeah uh to a bunch of songs for that movie that ultimately gets shelved and doesn't get made so uh the 90s could have been this big period of output for output for him for films yeah it's fascinating and i and i do think there has always been a certain type of person or artist that 
works well in Hollywood or wants to work in Hollywood or finds a way to like avoid Hollywood at all costs while still having a film career. <laughs> um, there are those different types of filmmakers and and then the composers and songwriters, whether it's Randy Newman or Danny Elfman, who just right. kind of work their way right in seamlessly. And so my guess would be that Sondheim just may not have wanted to deal with the business of Hollywood. And to your point about writing Goodbye for Now for Reds, like to deal with those sorts of back and forths with directors, not to mention all the other Hollywoodness and producers and things that come with that. But I, like you, am looking at his love of film. He also actually, he wrote the screenplay for The Last of Sheila in, I That's think, correct. 1973 yeah, yeah. with Anthony Perkins. So we know he was drawn to film and why he didn't do more sort of songwriting like this in the 90s or later in life, I, I, I really don't know. But I just do think for me being a filmmaker who is also a songwriter and I just, a lot of what I'm working on right now has always been to bring film and music together. And how can we tell stories uh, through yeah. film that are elevated through music and song. I um, am grateful for Dick Tracy, but similarly, I'm like, oh man, what did we miss out on? What 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 could there have been? This is the other thing is like, as much as Sondheim is lauded as being, you know, one of the titans of musical theater and pushing the art form forward, film's loss was the theater's gain to many, of course. For, for, for all intents and purposes, because I think if he had had his wish granted, that's what he would be would have done a lot more of. It just so happens that he was coming of age um, and really starts to become popular and uh, being able to write more for film just as like the movie musical is completely considered passe. <laughs> like just people yes. just didn't want to make them anymore. It, except that it's also the Disney Renaissance is simultaneously. That is true. It's happening. So. Well, I, I, I also, I also proffered this, so like knowing that he knew Howard Ashman. Right. It's like, yeah. I wonder if they could have convinced him to write for a, a Disney musical. Yeah. Or a Disney yeah. animated film. Yeah. Possibly. Um, I mean, obviously it, that's all conjecture and who knows if that would have been good or bad mm. or whatever it would have been. But um, yeah, I just think also, I, I remember hearing Sondheim say, and this has stuck with me, that in one of those interviews, he said, I'm a dramatist. He, I think he said something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I am a dramatist who is writing plays through songs. So, so I'm paraphrasing. But yeah. when I heard him say that, I'm a dramatist, like he views himself as telling a story with his, which is dialogue, story, characters, relationships through song. And back to my connection with Sondheim, when he said that, I was like, that's similar to how my brain works. Again, I'm not suggesting <laughs> I'm speaking his language or, or have his genius, but thinking of like, how can I tell a story through song is something that he viewed himself as. And if you're going to do that in a film, you really almost never get that freedom to tell the story the way you want to tell it. And yeah, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken got there, but, and Lynn manuel is sort of getting to do some of that now as of course, Bobby Lopez and his wife are. But even still, I think all of them were still very much playing within that film system. And I can just imagine Sondheim like trying to open his mind up to that and just not getting to maybe play in the sandbox and yeah. be the dramatist that he viewed him as, which is why he's like writing the tunes for Dick Tracy was fine because it was it was window dressing. You know, it was Yeah, he didn't was, have to deal with all of that. <laughs> yeah. So that's sort of my thought on that. Again, who knows? But when 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 he, you view yourself that way, Hollywood is really great at sort of closing you in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Josh, thank you so much for coming here and discussing Dick Tracy in full. Uh, if people wanted to, oh, actually, I forgot to do my wrap up question here. So let me ask you the wrap up question I've been asking everyone this mini series, which is because Dick Tracy is uh, based on a comic strip. I'm curious what your favorite comic strip of all time is. And if you didn't read comic strips, then you can expand that to comic books. But I am asking you your favorite comic strip. So I've heard you ask this on one of the other episodes, and I thought, I never read comic strips. But then I remembered I used to have a little daily calendar that was the far side. Do you oh, remember the far course. side? I do. Yeah, there were these one panel 
cartoons uh, or, or strips, and it was, you know, a sort of one-liner jokes uh, about, like, there were commentary on society or just, like, silly situations. And, yeah, I would, every year for a couple of years, junior high, high school, someone would give me that for Christmas. And so every day I'd have a far side. So I think that yeah. was a comic strip, right? Yeah, I would, I would count that. That's great. I love the far side growing up, although I've now lived long enough to where on the internet there is whole groups around like what's this far side comic mean <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. like, so we're trying to disseminate what the joke actually is and i feel like i'm a billion years old because it's like it's funny because it's a cow saying it i don't know what else you need <laughs> like that's, that's what's that's funny great, about it <laughs> that's amazing and and again i haven't thought of far side for, mm -hmm. I don't know, 20 plus years until I heard you ask this question to someone on another episode. <laughs> so, great. well, um, yeah. I'm glad I so, could unearth that memory for yeah, you. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Other than comic books, I loved Batman, but yeah. again, I was always a movie guy. Like, I would yeah. buy the comic books, but then not really read them. Instead, I would just put the video VHS in again or watch the oh, animated that's interesting. show. I was, I was definitely the movie guy. And then the only superhero I cared about was uh, Spider-Man. I collected like every comic book I could find with Spider-Man in it mm. for whatever reason. I did draw a lot. Oh, that's I was cool. always drawing. So like I would pull the comic books to draw. From. I have no artistic ability whatsoever. Yeah. So <laughs> Josh, thank you so much for joining me here today. If people wanted to stay in contact with you or see what you're up to online, what's the easiest way to do so? I would say the best way is on Instagram, which is at Josh M. Shelton m for miles and or i'm i'm on linkedin as well if if you're that type of person and then the other thing which i actually forgot to mention i also write a lot of songs for a more kids family friendly instagram mm -hmm. and youtube called bird explorers and that's like bird explorers Amazing. cooking bird explorers music bird explorers <laughs> and i forgot to mention this but those tunes are all much more inspired by sherman brothers um right. and or you know cole porter or even that older sondheim and maybe that's another connection i have to sondheim and dick tracy which is you know sondheim writing into the woods or sweeney todd is one way his brain goes but then he can also write those pastiche songs that are more older style i similarly like to play with i write these older style you know tunes classic disney tunes for this bird explorers channel but then my musical films are you know something else so yeah. I just want to know if I can rent you out to play the trumpet. You know, I do. I grew up playing trumpet. I don't play as much <laughs> trumpet anymore. I have it on the piano. I'll play at Christmas time. I actually have a, a, a kid's book coming out this year where I recorded a, a New Orleans style version of the 12 days of Christmas. And I Amazing. tried to record some trumpet for it. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the chops anymore. So um, <laughs> to do that style, I, I can do, I can play quiet. Uh, yeah, simple thing. <laughs> I can play Reverie. That's about it. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kyle. I really appreciate I'm it. You, but all's fair in love and business. Whose side are you on? Side I'm always on. Mine. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. This is an independent production. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. Putting Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next time we're together, like I said, we're going to be doing some bonus episodes, but soon it's going to be our Assassin's season. You know why? Because everyone has the right to be happy. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now. Is Dick Tracy.